It's hardly news that the newspaper business is on the ropes. Some papers have folded completely, others have reduced the number of pages, virtually an entire industry in free fall, due mainly to easy access to the web, offering news practically as it happens. The most recent casualty is the New Orleans Times Picayune, an institution that's seen the city through good times and the worst of times a part of the very fabric of a unique American city. Last October, the Times-Picayune began publishing only three days a week, making New Orleans the largest American city without a daily paper. Advanced publications owned by the Newhouse family decided on major surgery for the paper before the economics of publishing killed it outright. We visited New Orleans just prior to the amputation. The story will continue in a moment. There's no doubt New Orleans is a city like no other. A wonderful ethnic cocktail, a place that dances to its own rhythm, and a town devoted to its traditions, like the Times Picayune, the legendary newspaper that had published every single day in New Orleans for 175 years. The tradition of waking up in the morning and breaking that cup of coffee and opening up that paper, it seems to be going by the wayside. When you take away a venerable institution like the Times picking you, and you really kind of take away a piece of the soul of a city. When Mitch Landrew, the mayor of New Orleans, says the loss of a daily paper is a terrible blow to a city that has had more than its fair share of misfortune. People in the city were worried that it was going to send a message to the rest of the country that we want a big league city because we're not going to have a daily paper. But the facts of life are that newspapers are folding all over the country. It's a dying business. It may be, but that doesn't mean that people have to like it. New Orleanians yeah. may be outraged that the paper now publishes only three days a week, but they still start those days with their coffee and beignets and their times pick. Established in 1837, it was called the Picayune because that's how much it cost. One Picayune, an old Spanish coin. The paper became a civic watchdog, a nemesis of corrupt politicians like Huey Long. Classic American writers like O. Henry and William Faulkner wrote for the paper. It won several Pulitzer Prizes, most recently for its reporting of Hurricane Katrina. It has a central role that newsmen like me dream of, and it's hard to not have a crush on it. David Carr, a reporter who covers all things media for the New York Times, says the Times-Picayune was one of the few things that worked in a city that generally doesn't. Schools aren't great. Public housing doesn't go very well. They have problems with their police. They've always had a really good newspaper. If it works, how come it's going under? Delivering a newspaper, like making it stump on your doorstep, it's a really hard business. It's an expensive business. What the new houses did is said, you know what, this only really works three days a week. So let's cut to those three days. That's when it pays. As sad as it is to witness local newspapers die or slowly disappear, technology and the economic facts are inescapable. The lumbering and expensive process of rolls of newsprint being fed into gigantic presses that spew out tons of newspapers which must be loaded onto trucks that drive into the night to ultimately deliver the paper to doorsteps, diners, and newsstands. It seems almost quaint when you consider that the same news, only fresher, can be dispatched at the speed of light to millions at a fraction of the cost. And yet, the Times Picayune still showed a profit. I think that uh, Times-Picayune was making money, but the trend lines for all of Newhouse's newspapers, including the Times-Picayune, was down 8 to 10 percent every single year. So it's sort of an existential threat. So Steve Newhouse, chairman of the company's digital arm, announced a massive restructuring to build a viable future for the paper. The focus would shift to the paper's 24-hour website. A print edition would be published only Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. More than 200 people would lose their jobs, 
press operators, copy editors, photographers, and distinguished senior reporters. The changes were called painful, but inevitable. Steve Newhouse declined to be interviewed. He referred us to Jim Amos, the highly respected longtime editor of the paper. Did you agree with the decision to start publishing only three days a week? Well, we've been grappling, as all metro newspapers in this country have, with what's happening to our industry, and that is um, a steady decline in, in circulation, a steady decline in print ad revenue, and um, the solutions, uh, there aren't many. Uh, one is to act as though nothing were happening and continue business as usual. To me, that's presiding over a gradual irrelevancy and, and a gradual death. What you're saying is that the patient was dying and the only way to save it was to cut off all four limbs and replace it with an artificial one. The patient, and by that uh, I would say the, the national patient, has been uh, in a lingering illness for a very long time. And some of the doctors are standing by and wringing their hands. Um, and some are walking away and saying, this is an incurable illness. And uh, others are actually trying um, operations that have a good chance of, of succeeding. The company is hoping that by reducing the number of publishing days at many of its 35 regional newspapers, it will drive readers to their websites. They are determined, determined to transform these newspapers into digital franchises. But if you think of most newspapers are in the emergency room, right? They're all wounded one way or another. And you pick the Times-Picayune, one of, really one of the stronger papers in America, and say, ah, oh, we'll do major surgery on that one. It seems odd. Did they anticipate the kind of outrage that the announcement produced? They knew they were going to get some blowback. I don't, I don't think they expected the gale force winds, the hurricane winds that came at them. I mean, people were frantic. Advertisers declared their objections. Rallies were held for fired employees, and Save the Picayune posters sprung up throughout the town. The city council passed a resolution urging the owners to continue printing daily. And an open letter was published where local worthies warned that the new houses were losing the trust of the community. If the new houses have given up on New Orleans, as they have, why not just sell it? Don't hold us hostage. Ann Milling, a local philanthropist, is one of several prominent New Orleanians who supported the protest. She was joined by Gregory Amont, Archbishop of New Orleans, and Lolas Eli, a writer and former Times Picayune columnist. Why this outrage over a newspaper cutting back? Part of what happened, particularly after Katrina, was a sense of community. And the Times Picayune was a big part of that. The paper published literally through hell and high water. Dozens of reporters kept the world informed about what was happening while even their own homes were flooded. In the aftermath, the paper became a beacon of civic solidarity. We've recovered a great deal, but we still have a long way to go. There are serious issues before us that we need that daily watchdog voice. Archbishop, this has more to do with mammon than with God. How come you got <laughs> so deeply involved in it? I got deeply involved because I'm from New Orleans. I was born and raised here. I have a great love for uh, the people in the city and our tradition. But besides that, I really am concerned about the elderly and the poor. This puts them in a very disadvantaged position. The reduced paper was portrayed as a bold step into the digital future. But New Orleans is one of the least wired cities in the country, with more than a third of the city without internet access. That's huge in terms of the population of this community. And you can say, oh, well, maybe these people don't read the newspaper, but I can promise you, you can see people, black, white, young, old, Hispanic, Vietnamese, buying newspapers at drugstores, grocery stores, sitting at coffee shops. People read the Times Picayune. Well, I think what the, the suggestion is that the future looked very bleak for the paper and like any business, they got to look ahead. But one of the puzzling things for me is that we know that there are others, specifically Mr. Tom Benson, who was willing to buy the paper. Tom Benson, a local billionaire, owner of the New Orleans Saints football team, offered to buy the paper to keep it printing daily. He was told the paper was not for sale. 
if someone is foolish enough to want to buy a newspaper and you're in the business of showing a profit, you'd think you would jump at the offer. Well, I think our owners are also in the business of newspapering and journalism and care about the preservation of the news report that we are going to be able to deliver in this town. I know that sounds terribly altruistic, but um, I, I, I've just seen so much evidence of that being the case. Did you expect that this decision would be made with such outrage? Well, I, I'm, I'm a product of this community. This is my hometown. Uh, I think I know it well, and um, I, I understand the sadness, I understand the anger, and we all have something in common, and that is that we're, we're driven by a passion for this city. Lolas Eli, the former columnist, has the passion, but doesn't believe the abbreviated paper will satisfy it. How can half as many people cover the same amount of news with half as many resources? You fear for the quality of the journalism. Though the owners promise an improved website and created new jobs to service it, Eli says it's geared towards fun and games rather than watchdog journalism. Do you feel that a newspaper online is a toothless watchdog? It's not the same if, if I call you and I say, Morley, I'm going to put this story online two weeks from now or you know, three days from now. It's not the same thing. There's no law of nature that says that that kind of journalism is inextricably linked to ink on paper. We fully intend to continue to produce the kind of public trust journalism for which they know us. New Orleans is a kind of reporter's delight, yeah. you'd have to well, admit. Of course it is. Yes? Yeah. I mean, we tell uh, good stories now. Yeah. <laughs> we tell good stories. And, and <laughs> oh, we make good stories. There's a lot of hanky-panky goes on. Yes, sir. Do you think that the city and state are going to suffer because the watchdog isn't on watch in quite the same way. Right. I hope not. The more robust press we have, the better everybody is. So I'm hoping that that is not going to suffer. The great steel presses of the Times, Picayune are mostly silent now, reduced to working less than half the time. The question is, will it become less than half of what it once was? And there are rumblings that an even larger Newhouse newspaper, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, founded in 1842 and with a circulation close to 300,000, could soon be next.